I consider Stan to be my best friend. I met him when he came out here in 1980 for 12 months to establish residential qualifications in case things went bad in Zimbabwe and how bad they went. Stan is going to tell you about his um, experiences as a, an Air Force pilot in the Road East Air Force. And then he went farming. He was a road scholar studying irrigation in uh, Africa and he was a noted cattle breeder and I'm now going to call on Stan to speak to you. I just like to correct Brian, he was a nothing or scholar, not a road scholar. I wish it had been. <laughs> I'm looking around and I can see half a dozen faces that were here when I gave the first speech uh, talk to the Old Flyers group. And there were 12 at the Old Flyers group in those days. And it was in April 2004. I just arrived from Zimbabwe and uh, I gave the first talk. So with those six people here, uh, bear with me if, if they hear a bit of repetition. I'm going to bore you with a bit of history because unless I give you this history, you won't understand how Rhodesia, founded in 1890 with a bunch of 250 pioneers who were raising a flag in the bush, was able to uh, progress to, in over 50 years to the stage where it hosted a major branch of the Empire Training Scheme and also had the reputation of being the breadbasket of Southern Africa. And then over the next 50 years, it progressed or digressed to a basket case called Zimbabwe. So that's the story I'm going to give you today. Of course, mentioning as much as I can the flying history uh, of Rhodesia as well. It all started with a gold rush in the Boer Republic in Johannesburg. The, the reef there went uh, down rapidly and they thought it would in what uh, was then Matabi land, a uh, piece of land occupied by a uh, fierce Zulu tribe that had moved there 60 years before in 1830 uh, and who made a living pilfering and uh, terrorizing the Shono tribes around them. So they were in the way of people going up there to look for this pot of gold up there that they thought was up there. Of course the uh, prospects were pretty persistent. They visited Logan Gurugula, the king of the uh, Matabili, uh, in his crawl, uh, trying to get uh, permission to prospect. And it was settled on roads with his huge influence and fortune that he'd made from the diamond uh, strike at Kimberley, who finally got uh, Lerman Gula to put his mark on, a, uh, on the right concession. Um, it was a document that one of his uh, men had got uh, Lerman Gula to put his mark on. And uh, Rose went to uh, London and with, with this concession uh, got permission to make a royal charter for his company, the British South Africa Company, and um, permission to settle uh, in a colony with the name of Rhodesia in the area to the north of Matabele Land. Uh, it was a very dangerous uh, mission because uh, they could have been attacked by the Indabili. And so he had the services, he, he contracted the services of a, a remarkable young man called Frank Johnson, who uh, undertook to do the whole thing for Rhodes for 90,400 pounds. And that was to recruit 250 um, young men, mostly from good South African families, from the Cape, uh, Cape families, to arm them and, and mount them, uh, uh, to purchase 117 ox wagons and thousands of trek oxen. And uh, I forgot to tell you that uh, to get his concession, Rhodes had armed the uh, Indabili with the latest Mar Mar Martini Henry rifles. So they were heavily armed with, with, a, with, a, with a very fancy rifle. So uh, Johnson decided to get some Maxim machine guns to counter these. And, and the secret weapon of the day was an electri electrically powered searchlight that would strike fear into the, into the natives when they attacked at night. So uh, the expedition was a success. They went from Botswana, or Karma Land in those days, uh, and came up through Fort Tuli and then skirted around Matabele Land, going up, establishing this Fort Victoria, and then going up to Salisbury, where this, this flag was raised in March 1890. They looked for gold around this area here, didn't find any, but then found gold going down towards Matabele Land, and it got better and better as they went down. They found a fabulous uh, uh, reef at Kwekwe, and they, they then knew they had to invade Matabele Land in order to get what they wanted. So they, uh, in, in 1893, uh, they marched down and attacked the Matabele and had two very bloody battles 
one on the Shangoni River, one on the Bimbiza River, bloody from, from the Matabili point of view, uh, and they uh, beat the, uh, the Matabili. They then made their way down to Bulawayo, which was local Guna's crawl, and it was Bulawayo means place of killing. He was a pretty ruthless bloke. Uh, but Raymond Guna had retreated north, and uh, Alan Wilson, Major Alan Wilson, and 50 men followed him, but were cut off by a flooded river, the Shangoni River, and were, were cut to pieces to a man. But anyway, uh, with the Matabili subdued, uh, the 250 pioneer settlers were given 3,000 acre farms, as they'd been promised, and permission to make 15 gold pegs, uh, to, to claim 15 gold pegs, which they all did. The Matabili, of course, weren't happy with the situation, and they planned a rebellion three years later that killed 350 of these settlers while they were in their beds at night uh, on their new farms. At the same time, there was an outbreak of rinderpest, which killed all these settlers' oxen and cattle. Uh, rinderpest is a cattle disease, a very serious one. And, but fortunately, uh, the telegraph line going south was still uncut, so they called for help, and uh, Rhodes came up with reinforcements, including Baden Powell, who was uh, the, the founder of the Scout, Scout movement. They came up, relieved the lager at Bulawayo and Salisbury, because uh, the Shona had also rebelled uh, when they saw what was happening. And then Rhodes went at great risk himself, went under, went under arm to the Matoba Hills and did a peace treaty with the Matabili, and there was peace for the next 70 years. So that's the briefest of the uh, colony of Rhodesia. Things went well, they found uh, a lot of minerals and gold, and the farming turned out to be very, very good because uh, there was the golden crop tobacco, and, and Rhodesia became the, the second biggest tobacco producer in the world. And over the next uh, 15, 16 years, until the First World War, uh, the population of uh, Rhodesia increased to 22,500. And during the First World War, 700 Rhodesians were killed in the, in the Great War. Of note, of course, was a young tobacco farmer, uh, Arthur Harris his name was, who volunteered for the Royal Flying Corps and uh, stayed on in the Royal Air Force afterwards and later became known as Bomber Harris. Of course, you've all heard of him. So that was the, uh, the brief history. The only other thing that happened of note in 1926 was the 5,000 white voters in, in, the, in the colony had, had a choice of joining South Africa as a fifth state or else becoming an independent colony, which they chose. And this was very significant, but I won't go any further on that. The thing that really brought, brought flying into the picture was the flight of the Silver Queen. This was the first flight from London to Cape Town. Two uh, uh, aviators, uh, Quinton Brand and Pierce von Reinefeldt, majors in the Royal Flying Corps, were given a Vickers Vimy to make this historic flight. And they took, off, took aboard three mechanics. Now, on the way down in, in Egypt, they force landed uh, Wadi Haifa and wrecked the, the Vimy. A replacement uh, fuselage was uh, shipped out to them, and the mechanics worked very hard and put the uh, original engines into the, uh, the Vimy, and off they went again, this time reaching Bulawayo. Bulawayo is down there. It took 19 different stops to get there from, from Egypt. Now, the whole population of Bulawayo was there in March 1920, including my father, my late father, and I'll relate to you what, what happened. They landed the Vimy on the race course, whisked off to the uh, Gala Ball uh, and treated like royalty. The next morning they to their to their Vimy, and they had to be refueled, tanks boom full, and after running the engines for 30 minutes, they took off. And what I don't think they took into account was the fact that Bulawayo was at 4,000 feet. Obviously, all the settlement that took place was at high altitude in Rhodesia because of malarial fever. The whites occupied this ridge of high country, plateau country, about 4,000 feet where there was no malaria. The Vimy crashed the other side of the trees and was written off, and the crew were very lucky to escape with their lives. General Smuts then sent them up a DH-9 aircraft, which they finished their trip to Cape Town. Now, uh, Brand and uh, Van Reinefeldt were knighted for this, and the, uh, the three ground crew, I believe, were given some peanuts. But that was the spark, that flight. And just a month later, after this uh, historic flight, uh, a, a commercial aircraft company was formed in Rhodesia, 
and flying then developed um, in Rhodesia much as it did in Australia, commercially and from the military point of view. By the time the Second World War broke out, the Rhodesian army had an air corps of Hawker Hearts and uh, they formed the Southern Rhodesian Air Force. But that was soon disbanded to form three Rhodesian squadrons, two being fighter squadrons and one being a Rhodesian bomber squadron. Uh, in these squadrons, uh, there were only 50,000 Rhodesian, uh, white Rhodesians living in the country then. Uh, 580 gave their lives, including uh, the father of my late wife, who was killed in a bomber raid uh, to Hamburg and was shot down going back over the North Sea by, by a night fighter. And he was killed at 26 years of age. Anyway, uh, the ma main thing, of course, is that Rhodesia was chosen as a major branch of the Empire Training Scheme. Uh, the Rhodesia Air Training Scheme was the branch of the Empire Scheme. And in the period of a year, in 1941, they built nine air bases, shipped out in crates, 260 Harvards, 290 Tiger Moths, 70 um, Ansons and Oxfords, thousands of air crew and ground staff to operate this. And uh, they chose Rhodesia because of its friendly skies, good weather, and more, more than anything else, the infrastructure that was there to support all this development. And of course, they trained tens of thousands of air crew during uh, the, the war years uh, in Rhodesia, some very famous names which I could, I could mention. And of course, more important is after the war, a lot of these air crew and ground staff came back to live in, that, in the beautiful country of Rhodesia and really swelled them in the white population. Of course, uh, there, uh, well, I only mention whites here, but of course there, there were uh, thousands of black volunteers as well uh, who fought in Burma and uh, in those countries. And of course, this well, they were pretty primitive when they went away and came back much wiser. And that may, might be in the beginnings of black nationalism in Rhodesia from these ex-servicemen. Anyway, when the Empire Training Scheme was, was wound down at the end of the war, and the Southern Rhodesian Air Force was uh, re-established with the task of running two pilot training courses a year so that a pool of trained fighter pilots could, could be there in case of another war as part of the uh, British Commonwealth contribution. And uh, the Rhodesian Air Force uh, took over uh, the necessary Tiger Moths and Harvards from the Empire training. Uh, they also obtained six Dakotas, two Dragon Rapides, four Oysters, and they purchased a squadron of Mark 22 Spitfires. These Spitfires were flown out in two um, ferry flights from London, from England to Rhodesia. Uh, but the second ferry had a very tra tra tragic incident. Well, the, the most inexperienced pilot, a flight sergeant, Love was flying over France uh, in formation and they got into bad weather. He only had six hours in Spitfires at the time and uh, very little instrument flying and of course he just lost it and went straight in and he was buried next to his brother in France who had been killed in a, in a, in a Spitfire crash uh, in France during the war. So anyway, the first tra uh, pilot training course was set up in 1950 and you know, I arrived on the scene in 1936. I was born in Bulawayo. My early memories uh, as a youngster was yellow tiger moths and hornets flying around everywhere. And they made a great impression on me and I became very keen and was a very keen aero modeler, uh, of course control line in those days, but now I'm a, still a keen aero modeler in my, in my second childhood, but this time radio controlled. And uh, I joined the Rhodesian Air Force as soon as I possibly could when I turned 17. The training I received would have been very, very similar to the training that you in this room today would have had uh, in the services at that period or even, even during the war years. We did 80, 80 hours in Tiger Moths with a big emphasis on aerobatics and cross-country flying. But of course, we had no, no aids whatsoever. We didn't have, even have radios in our Tigers. And uh, so when we got lost in the bush, which was very often, we just had him fly towards the railway line fly down and read the name of the, uh, the, the station on the railway line and we then knew where we were. I'm sure you all had the same trick as well. <laughs> <laughs> These were the aircraft used uh, for the Empire training. That was the old Anson for, 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 for twin engine training and of course the Dakotas. Uh, th those are the Spitfires that we purchased and as I say we did our target flying in uh, elementary flying in Tigers. And then we did 200 hours in Harvard uh, to wings we uh, also emphasis on aerobatics, uh, formation flying, and cross-country flying. The first four courses were went on to Mark Spitfire, uh, Mark 22 Spitfires, and my course, uh, I was in course six. Five and six were the first courses on to vampires. 
But there's a, a pictures of, this, of our rock tribute to the Spitfires. Uh, now, that was um, me getting into Harvard during, uh, before I got my wings. And uh, that was still part of the, of the um, army. I saw uh, the Southern Red Eastern Air Force was, was part of the army. And I'll just show you my battle tunic. Uh, we had army uh, khaki, but then we they formed the Royal Red Eastern Air Force. They wouldn't give us new uniforms, so we, they just gave us uh, Air Force ranks and, and that we used on our, on our khaki uniform. Right, for operational training, we went on uh, using the Harvard uh, air to ground, using the grounding machine gun in the one wing, and 10-pound uh, bombs for high dive and low-level bombing. And the only incident I can think of in, my, uh, in this stage of our training was uh, when I, I pulled out of a dive too late, uh, firing on a target, and found my whole aircraft covered in mud, windscreen included, <laughs> with the bullets uh, 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 splashes through the ricocheting off the ground, which uh, I must have been pretty low. And the only other thing that I can remember was our last night in Harvard's before we went on to Vamps, we decided to meet up, the four of us decided to meet up in the flying area for a highly illegal dogfight. And in the process of having this dogfight, two of the Harvard's collided. <laughs> and, uh, for, for, and by a miracle, uh, one, one they were pulled out of his dive and, and, and did a very high speed force landing, and he got out and waved was uninjured, and the other bloke with a very badly damaged um, starboard wing and no, and no air on, uh, flew back because he had a full fuel tank on the other wing. So that was just something I remember. Now we'll go on to, that was a, a photograph I took information on my wings cross country, um, and that was the uh, old harvest we got from the Empire training scheme. And now that's when we went on to VAMPS. Now this is interesting. Um, before this picture was taken, when I was still in the, uh, on Harvard, the Rhodesia, Rhodesia had given up its independence to form the Federation of Rhodesia and Iceland. Uh, we wanted to tap into the wealth of Northern Rhodesia, very uh, rich in copper, and we, and we used the wealth from this federation. Uh, that's the Federation of Rhodesia and Iceland. There was Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia, and over there, little Niaceland. Uh, in Northern Rhodesia, I asked them, I wanted to join the 220,000 whites uh, in Southern Rhodesia for great numbers. And of course, we wanted the wealth of uh, the, the, cop the huge copper mining industry over there. And using these, uh, this money, we re-equipped the Rhodesian Air Force with vampires to replace the Spitfires, Hawker Hunters, squadron of Hawker Hunters, and, uh, and six Canberra bombers, and also many uh, helicopters. Uh, Adelaide helicopters. We did our, uh, our conversion, our vampire conversion, here at Victoria Falls, which was very pleasant, I can assure you. We were, sta we were stationed up there for six months, and, and for those who have been to the falls, uh, it, it, it's the most beautiful place in the world. We had the facilities of the uh, Victoria Falls uh, Hotel. We lived in, uh, at, at the International Airport at, um, at Livingston, which is just across the falls used to fly up the Zambezi Valley for our flying. Uh, we did this because the uh, airport at uh, Salisbury was being turned into an international airport and was being completely redone up. So that's why we were moved to Victoria Falls. And very pleasant it was too. But at this stage, my course was over and uh, I went back to civilian life. But I was able to buy an Auster from the Air Force that was selling. And I attended my gratuity of 250 pounds to obtain this. And I uh, was, was persuaded by my father to go farming in that stage because he had acquired a, a real piece of land, uh, much equivalent to what's in the southern Kimberleys, 26,000 acres, and he wanted me to develop it. So I, uh, I decided to go to Weeby Agricultural College, which, which was probably one of the finest agricultural colleges in the world at the time, uh, very good practically and theoretically. And uh, it was a two-year course, and this college, I would say, was mainly responsible for the very high standard of farming in, the, in Rhodesia. It was known for its good farming because of the foundations laid by this college. And in, during this course at the college, I lost my enthusiasm for flying and, and gained the same enthusiasm for farming. So much so that I sold my Worcester because it was getting in the way of my studies. And as a result, came out as a duck student in my course. I then went on to the uh, farm, my dad's farm, married uh, six, six months after that. Fortunately, my wife was, my late wife was uh, from a farm family, so she, and like the bush, because our farming conditions were very primitive at that stage. Very similar to what you, what you would experience, you farmers here today, uh, if you'd gone farming in the Kimberleys at that time. 
Over the next uh, six years, I had four children. Over the next eight years, I developed a farm with 26,000 acre paddocks, uh, two uh, permanent watering points at least in each paddock, uh, three handling yards with cattle dips at each yard because we had a dip. I had 2,000 head of cattle which we had to dip every week. But there was plenty of cheap and labor. They used to get 30 shillings a month. And I was able to develop this farm pretty well and decided to apply for a Nuffield scholarship because the government had uh, agreed to build a very big irrigation dam on my farm and I thought I needed the, uh, it was going to be a settler irrigation scheme and I thought I needed the uh, expertise, the American, American expertise to, to develop this. So I applied for a Nuffield scholarship and the, uh, Sir Humphrey Gibbs, who was the chairman of the selection board, chose me and I went off. But I was very lucky because I was the last Nuffield scholar to go for the next 15 years. All this time I've been farming, the generation had been split up by the British government. The black nationalists up, up north in, in Northern Rhodesia and in Iceland had insisted on, uh, they, they weren't going to be ruled by the whites down south. So Kenneth Gordon was given Northern Rhodesia, which he, uh, he became the first premier of, of Zambia, and Dr. Hastings Banda of uh, Malawi, that was in Iceland. But, and Ian Smith was uh, then elected. I farmed uh, near Bulawayo, 90 kilometers from Bulawayo, uh, just over there. At, at about 20 inch rainfall, summer rainfall, I carried a capacity of about 15 acres to a breeding cow. I finished my training, uh, carried on farming, and then Ian Smith was, was elected uh, Prime Minister of Southern Rhodesia. The British government would not give us our own independence. They insisted on adult suffrage, universal suffrage. Three and a half million bucks, 250,000 whites. We would have committed a political suicide at that stage by allowing this. So Ian Smith uh, was very scared that the British government would legislate this change, so he declared unilateral independence. But let me tell you about Ian Smith. He was a pretty genuine sort of bloke with a very uh, distinguished flying career. You might notice that one side of his face uh, is different to the other side. He had a very, very bad big crash in, when he uh, threw his foot far into a, uh, a concrete bunker on takeoff. And somebody who saw the crash afterwards said it was a miracle that he'd survived this crash. Anyway, it took uh, many months to recover from his injuries. Uh, he had a paralyzed face from then on. Uh, he got back to his unit, uh, the Rhodesia, Rhodesia Squadron, flying in Italy at that stage, and was shot down in Italy. He, he fought with the partisans for five months before making, making his way over the mountains back to his own unit. And after the war, he returned to farming uh, with a passion for retaining um, Rhodesia forever in white rule. He declared unilateral independence from Britain. I did my scholarship just in time before all our passports were useless. We were, non we were, we were no longer were recognized as a country. But fortunately, uh, South Africa, who, the part in South Africa, had our sympathy and they allowed all our fuel and all our um, tobacco to be sold through them out, out of South Africa and all our fuel to come in. And, uh, and during those 15 years of, of uh, independence, of UDI, uh, the uh, Rhodesian economy just blossomed. Factories sprung up everywhere to make everything that we couldn't import, we made ourselves, including tractors, cars, yet the lot. We assembled cars, uh, even our weapons. And um, things went pretty well under that system until uh, what I mentioned, uh, coming to now. When I came back to my scholarship, um, but to America, I had been exposed to unbelievable farming technology that Jack Fletcher here, as a farm extension worker in America, brought to Australia. Uh, Jack, as you might not know, so at the same time as I was doing this in Rhodesia, he came and, and started a, a company up in the, uh, in the Kimberleys, a uh, four and a half million acre station country, of station country, and a huge 50,000 um, acre irrigation project at Campbellan, which he set up. And he was doing, on a very large scale, uh, what, what I was do doing exactly the same thing on a small scale in, in Rhodesia. I uh, established an irrigation scheme on this gov from this gov our government dam. Uh, that's a maize crop that I grew. That picture was a, won a contest, a photographic contest. It was in color, it's beautiful. That's of a, a maize crop with, a, with the uh, tropical storm that we got in, uh, in, in our summers behind. And there's a picture of uh, my cattle being driven to the dip every week. And of course, I, with all this going on, I won a number of farming competitions, and here I'm hosting a field day. I'm there with the uh, loud hailer, 
uh, talking to my group of my 200 farmers, looking at my feedlot, looking, looking at my feedlot, and all those cattle I had bred myself. I ran uh, uh, 1,800 breeders, producing about 1,500 uh, cattle for my feedlot each year. This was fine until uh, the wind of change. Uh, Harold Macmillan made this wind of change speech in the early 60s, and because the black nationalists in Rhodesia were now starting to be active, and what did Ian Smith do? He locked up Robert Mugabe and Joshua and Paul, who was the uh, leader, locked them up in jail for 11 years. Uh, Robert Mugabe made very good use of his time in jail. He was allowed to study correspondence, and he acquired a number of degrees in economics and in law, and he became a highly, a very educated man during his 11 years in jail. Uh, Joshua and Paul wasn't such an intellectual, and he just honed his wood, wood carving skills. When they released Mugabe and Koro, they skipped the country and started recruiting thousands of young blacks who were getting disillusioned with white rule. And these, these people went to uh, training camps in Russia and in China, were indoctrinated with communism and were taught uh, how to be uh, terrorists. In 1973, they started flooding back as trained terrorists into the country. By 1974, there were 30,000 floating around. Now we come to the Bush War. Why it was called the Bush War was uh, it was fought in the bush. These terrorists didn't go near the cities or the towns. Uh, they had needed the support of the, of the tribal people, and it, their main target was, was white farmers. So we had to take extreme precautions uh, farming there with uh, th this sort of vehicle. I had a couple of these on my farm. They were double-skin, bulletproof vehicles with bulletproof windscreens. They had anti-ambush de uh, devices that were electrically fired, shotgun shells electrically fired if you were ambushed. Uh, they had uh, V-shaped uh, bodies which deflected any mine blasts because these, mine, these, these terrorists were very well armed by the, by the Russians. They had landmines, they had rocket launchers, they even had SAM-7. And they shot down two of our Viscount airliners. The first one uh, was shot down uh, flying between Bulawayo and uh, Big Falls. Uh, the second one was shot down flying between Salisbury and Kariba, and that was very tragic because the pilot force landed, half the passengers in the back part survived the crash, and four of the uninjured passengers went for help, for water and help to the nearby village, and while they were away, the terrorists who had shot this aircraft down came along and massacred the injured passengers. So after that, Air Rhodesia used to fly at treetop height. So it was quite interesting doing commercial flights after that. Anyway, the, this war went on, and I'll just show you something some of the hardware we used. We had these gunships over here, and we had uh, the famous Lou Scouts who tracked these terrorists and would call in these gunships to take them out. Uh, these show us our, our RLI um, crowds, our troops, but uh, remember that three quarters of our army were blacks, raw blacks. And, um, and they, so these white troops and, and black troops used to work together very, very well. I, I'd been 20 years out of the Air Force, so I joined the police reserve. Uh, these were all far by my fellow farmers, and we were there to protect the uh, farming community. We'd uh, spend a week a month at the police camp, driving those protected vehicles, and each farm had its own uh, annual alert radio. And if, he was, if a farmer was attacked by a group of terrorists, he'd push up the panic button, and we would belt along as quickly as we could, while the farmer would hold off these terrorists. Uh, he had plenty of protection, he had anti-personnel lines around his perimeters, he would have sandbags around his house. Uh, he'd have floodlights on his perimeters. And he generally, he would hold off these uh, terrorists. Up to 90 of them would attack uh, until uh, we, we came along as a group of six. And uh, we did this for four or five years. And uh, uh, these were a group of uh, my fellow farmers. I, I'm over there. So this war went on until it reached a sales stalemate. We had a kill rate of so one Rhodesian force member to 10 terrorists kill rate of that. <laughs> because they were pretty, pretty hopeless. What was happening, we were losing our white population for different reasons. All these young people here were spending, uh, if they were under 35 years of age, were spending uh, six weeks in the army and then went home for 10 days. And this went on for years. And these, a lot of these people were professional men and, 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 they, and their families couldn't take it. So they were starting to immigrate to, to South Africa. And so we were losing our white population. Uh, the terrorists were losing their, their number too. It was agreed upon to have a peace conference, which was held uh, in 1979 at Lancaster House in London. At first, Mugabe didn't want to have a bar of making peace, 
that uh, Sir Royal Michel, who was a communist leader of Mozambique, who had kicked out all air rights a few years earlier, said to uh, Mugabe, don't kick out your rights because uh, look, look, look what will happen to your country, it will be like ours. And Mugabe took his advice. Uh, Ian Smith was having the same pressures put on him by the South African government. They were tired of all the criticism they were getting from the outside world for supporting Rhodesia, and they put the screws on, on Ian Smith and said, if you don't settle, we're going to pull the plug on you. There was a settlement that was very good. It gave the whites 20 seat, uh, seats in Parliament out of a total of 100. There was a guarantee that the white-owned farms would not be touched for 20, for 10 years. And But in spite of all these assurances, I wasn't happy with Mugabe coming in as our Prime Minister. And uh, fortunately for me, my father had left me uh, when he died in 79 a good portfolio of shares in South Africa because he had farming interests in Botswana. And uh, I sold those shares and bought my farm here at Williams in West Australia. After doing a recce of the whole world, I chose West Australia. Why? It was the closest place I could find to Rhodesia. I had no intention of farming here. I wanted to get back to my own place. But I did want the security of having a farm here, and I, and I sent my four children here for their tertiary education, and three of the four stayed, and one is still in Zimbabwe. I, I stayed here for a year uh, to get my permanent residence in 1981, and that's when I met my friend, my friend Brian, who was peddling his aerial photograph pictures around the district uh, at the time. And I convinced him to run his um, uh, safari trips to uh, Southern Africa because he'd been doing that, that up into the northern regions of Australia. He did that over about 11 years, and he actually talked to the old flyers two years ago, him and Ray Billerman, and told you all about that. When I got back from Australia, having left my family in Perth, their studies, I found a very nasty situation. There was a civil war going on. I'll just go back to my slide of Rhodesia in Matabili land. Matabili didn't want to be ruled by the Shonas. Mugabe was a Shona. And so the terrorists uh, refused to hand in their weapons, and they continued the war into independence, killing as many white farmers as they could. We lost 350 white farmers in Matabili, in Matabili land, we lost 50. Because uh, these terrorists were no longer uh, badly trained. They were hardcore. They would ambush and never miss. And so we went back, we went back to using our protected vehicles. It was a very nasty time. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't a tennis player in those days because we had a tennis club at our, at our country club. And six of our farmers went to the tennis club to play tennis. And after tennis, they were playing darts in the bar. And a terrorist gang walked in and shot the six farmers. but didn't touch their wives. They left their little wives untouched. Uh, that's the sort of thing which, that was happening all the time. And from that photograph uh, that I showed you of our army, of our police reserve group, two or three of those fellows were murdered uh, in uh, by being ambushed. This terrorist war went on for another five years. When Mugabe did exactly the same thing as he's doing with Chumburai now, he offered Joshua Kobo a vast presidency in his, in his government, with all the perks to go with it, plus all uh, Joshua Kobo's mates. So he, he actually was able to stop the, the war by doing that. But he had killed about 20,000 uh, Matabili tribesmen during that terrorist war by sending his uh, 5th Brigade, which were very ruthless, uh, North Korean trained brigade sending them into their villages and massacring them uh, into the Matabili. And I had Matabili working for me who refused to go home to their tribal areas because of the fear of being killed by these uh, by this foot brigade. And Mugabe is very scared to stand down now because he would, could easily face a war tribunal hearing what he did at that, at that time. But with the um, terrorist war over, we had 11 golden years. Uh, the country prospered, Mugabe behaved himself, he'd come to our farming conferences and say, you blokes are doing a fantastic job, uh, just carry on, we're not going to do anything to you. And um, we prospered, we, our tobacco was flooding the world, my beef was going to Europe, uh, free of tariffs. Uh, Mugabe was the, was the blue-eyed boy of the Western world. It went very well in 1981, this was probably the, the peak of my farming career when I, when I won the Cattle in the Year Award. With, uh, my, that was my late wife, and in uh, 1989 I won the award and became a judge of the Cattlemen of the Year Award uh, competition after that. Then, of course, in um, 1993, things went horribly wrong for me. On the 19th of December, 1993, I went out for my evening run with my young 
grandchildren who were staying with me. I took my dogs. And my wife stayed behind to cook the evening meal. And when we got back, we found she'd been virtually murdered. Of course, after that, things were never the same. We were, things got worse in 1997 when McGarvey's wife, Sally, died. And he married his very nasty secretary, Grace McGarvey. And everything that has happened since then, I put the blame on Grace. After he married her, he decided to give the ex-terrorist, this is 20 years after the terrorist war, a $50,000 bonus. And of course, uh, $50,000 Barbie dollars in those days was, was, was $50,000. And it ruined the country. Billions of dollars being paid to these so-called uh, freedom fighters. And then, of course, uh, he then decided to send his air force and, tr and troops into, into the Congo to support his mate Kabila. And uh, this was costing Rhodesia a million pounds, American dollars a day, American million dollars a day. And of course, uh, Mugabe was getting the diamonds for his own use. And then, of course, uh, the MDC under Chumbra Lai started as an opposition party in about 1996. And Mugabe decided to have a referendum to increase his powers, give him dictatorial powers. Chumbra Lai was able to convince the, the voters of Zimbabwe, who were all black at that stage, or mostly black, that this wasn't a good idea, and Mugabe's referendum was de defeated. This, of course, um, put the fear of God into Mugabe. He thought he'd, be, he'd lose his dictatorship. So he then decided to take white-owned farms and dish them out to the blacks uh, to get the favor of the, of the blacks again. The, the reason why uh, there was a shortage of land at this stage, the Rhodesia have always been divided into the white farming areas and the black farming areas. The white farming areas were magnificent farming areas, but the black farming areas, because of bad farming, had been ruined. And so there was a real land shortage um, in the country. And the rest is history. Uh, the white farms were taken, including mine. At first I lost half my land, Lancaster Ranch, and I was able to move the stock into my feedlot, 22,000 head, which I had to fatten in slaughter. And then three years later, uh, the balance was taken. For those farmers who didn't, didn't get off their farms, or were uh, stuck in jail. And for those who tried to resist, the government would send out assassination squads and knock them off. I found myself um, without a farm, and with a farm in Australia, with three of my four children living in Australia, where else would I go? So uh, I came in December 2003, just in time to talk to the one of the first off meeting. Thank you.